Hi, welcome to everybody who is just joining. We'll just wait for people to arrive before we kick off formally. These things take a few minutes. Uh, I can see the number creeping up, so uh, hopefully you can all see and hear us. And we'll get started in a couple of seconds. Welcome to everybody who's just joining. Particularly grateful if you've made it after a day of teaching in a very hot classroom. Hope you've got a nice drink with lots of ice. As we're just waiting for the last few uh, attendees to, to join, please do pop your, your name in the chat and say hi to us. Uh, we're gonna be encouraging questions throughout today's session. So it'd be great if, uh, if we could hear from you in the chat, please just pop hello and, uh, and your name, uh, perhaps even where in the country you are as well. That'd be lovely. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Jasmine. Brilliant. Oh, hi Matt, nice of you to join us. Becky, Mackenzie, lovely. Thank you, Shelby and Anna and Juliet and Sarah Jane. Goodness me, there's so many people. Um, I think my number has stopped creeping up, so I think we can probably uh, get started. There's lots to, to crack through, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to this really exciting webinar. Uh, I am thrilled to be hosting today. My name is uh, Faye Lance from the National Literacy Trust. I am our Head of Schools Programmes and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Hannah Lowe, who's gonna be chatting to me today. Um, just a few bits of admin before we get started. So as I said, uh, we are going to be um, encouraging questions throughout uh, throughout the session. So please do, um, if you could pop your questions into the Q&A function on the webinar, that would be great. Uh, if you just want uh, myself to see it, then I'll, I'll kind of direct those to Hannah. Uh, if you want to chat with each other or comment on the poetry as, as we go through, then please obviously uh, be chatting to each other in the chat. We really encourage that, really encourage you to get involved as well. Um, we are recording the session today uh, and the recording will be made available um, after the session. So, um, Hannah Lowe was born in Ilford to an English mother and a Jamaican Chinese father. She is an award-winning poet whose most recent collection, The Kids, won the Poetry Book Society Choice Award, was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize, was Poetry Book of the Year in the Irish Times and The Guardian, and won the Costa Book of the Year Award. Hannah was a teacher in an inner city sixth form college for 10 years and is now a lecturer in creative writing at Brunel University. Welcome, Hannah. Oh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Hot. Hot. Oh. <laughs> hi, everyone. Exactly that. Cool. Um, no, we're, we're absolutely thrilled to have you join us today. Thank you so much. Um, particularly because it looks like you're really busy at the moment, doing lots of work with the kids, kind of dashing off around the country and, and doing all sorts. So thank you for fitting us in, especially. My pleasure. <laughs> um, Hannah, uh, I sort of mentioned at the, at the top of this, your, your most recent uh, award was the Costa Book of the Year Award, which is incredibly exciting, but we now know that you're also the last ever Costa Book Award winner. Um, how does that feel? Well, I'm the last unless some other corporate sponsor doesn't swoop in <laughs> and take it over, which I'm still thinking might possibly happen. But um, it feels, to be honest, it's look, I mean, in a way, like there's one part of me that thinks, oh, thank God I got in before they, <laughs> before they finished the prize. But the other part of me feels very sad because it's a huge loss uh, to the book trade, um, the Costa Prize. It's a promotion that runs, you know, from uh, November when all the shortlists get announced right through over Christmas. So a lot of independent bookshops sell tons of books through, through the Costa promotion. So in a way, it's not the winners. You don't, it's not really about the people that write the books that then aren't going to win this prize because there's so few of them. It's actually about the book trade and the effects on that that's why I'm kind of hoping someone else is gonna pick up the prize and, and keep it going yeah fingers crossed absolutely um I'd love you to tell us before you before we ask you to read a few of your poems uh, from the kids um I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about your career your background in particular I think we're going to have a lot of teachers joining us today so it'd be great to know you know what was that moment when you stopped introducing yourself as a teacher and started to describe yourself as a writer um well, I'm not sure that there ever has been that one moment, but certainly it was because of teaching that I became a writer. 
it was um, years of teaching poetry. I mean, no one's more surprised than me in a way that I ended up writing poetry because I spent years in front, in front of classes teaching it, but not really feeling like I wanted to write it. It was, um, it was a particular anthology that I had to teach. It was A-level English, literature and language, the old syllabus, OCR syllabus. I think it was like a thousand years of English poetry. And I found myself being strangely moved by poems that I wouldn't have thought, like I wouldn't have expected, I suppose, to, to have had an impact on me. I, I'm thinking of people like um, Gerald Manley Hopkins. And, uh, and then at the same time, my mum had bought me an anthology of contemporary poetry and I started, started to read that uh, Blood Axe anthology, Staying Alive. And then I just started to write in secret. Uh, and I just kept on writing for a good few years, actually, before I sort of announced that's what I was doing to anyone a good couple of years before I took a course in, in writing poetry so I was quite a late bloomer I was, I was probably about 30 and all of that amazing. no that's so so fascinating like it's yeah it's really interesting to kind of hear that that transition um and of course you are still in the classroom although it's a university classroom now you're still still there aren't you at the chalk face <laughs> Yeah, and to be honest, I mainly teach undergrads who are very like the kids that I taught at the <laughs> like a year older or two years older. Uh, but it, but it's a different, it's a very different vibe teaching at university. All kinds of things are different. One of the one of the real things that isn't there at university is the day to day kind of camaraderie that you have. You know, busy kind of. I mean, I was in a sick form, but I'm sure the same is true of secondary schools as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, well, should we should we crack on with some poems? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd love you to, to start I'm reading. I'm gonna try and share my screen and hope it didn't go wrong. So let's have a look. Okay, rehearsal, yeah, we're good. Okay, we're gonna play from start. I thought I would just quickly talk about the front cover in case anyone doesn't know um, anything about the book. But the front cover is from, uh, it's the Rock Against, no, uh, sorry, Carnival Against Racism, uh, 1993, I think, uh, in Brockwell Park. And that's me in the background there, stood to the um, right of the banner. And I suppose I put this uh, this cover on the book, partly to kind of announce, you know, to say that we're all kind of kids once, I suppose, but there's more to it than that. But I wanted to show you the real image as well. Um, which is obviously a colour, it was a colour photo and someone happened to be there that day with a disposable camera, obviously it's before the time of phone cameras and all of that stuff. And I just think the image is an interesting, the two images together, I think they say a little bit about what poetry does, like it draws from the raw material of life, not that a photograph is raw material, obviously a photograph in itself is mediated, but but this was this was the real photo and then there's lots of sort of cropping and changing and augmenting that's gone on for the cover image, which I think is sort of analogous to what, to what I've tried to do in these poems. Um, without further ado, I shall read on. I'll read the second poem in the collection, which is the one about my first day of becoming a teacher. But I think um, it mentions in the poem, um, a white dog and the white dog has actually sort of jumped across from the first poem. And the white dog in the first poem is, is, is my dad, a symbol of my dad um, who had died when I was 21 and was really, his death was really the catalyst for why I became a teacher. Um, I was kind of looking for, you know, to find meaning or for a kind of life of more gravitas, I suppose. Um, and so he, the, the white dog crops begin in this poem. I'm just gonna get, I've got the animation on. Um, the Register. That first September, I climbed the blue stone steps past Shakespeare's doubtful face, an old mosaic of Jamaica, and the ruby blot of lips where last year's girls had kissed the schoolhouse brick. Now this year's crop pushed past, all clattery chat, their first day back, what's up? Salam, the Fuji's blaring from someone's phone, ready or not. And with that old white dog still barking softly in my head, I walked the sugar papered hall and pushed the classroom door to find a sprawl of teenagers sat waiting, my resetters all back to do what they'd already failed. I took my seat and called the register, Denise, Tyrone, Alicia, Chantel. And I'll read straight on, um, I'll read a few poems in a row. And I think it's worth 
me saying that when I, so I became a teacher when I was, yeah, 22, I didn't have um, an English literature degree. And so I was often sort of just only a couple of steps ahead of the, the students that I was teaching. Um, and we were such kind of like bleeding heart liberals in, in the English department that we'd really let anyone onto A-level English. So we've got often got kids that had like wanted to do science, hadn't got the grades to do science, so we ended up in English. Uh, so we had a lot of like kids that were relu reluctant, students that were reluctant readers, I suppose. Um, and uh, yeah, this poem is about, it's about that moment in the classroom when you're trying to get through a text, the students are trying to get through a text and you sort of, you know, it's raining outside, it's three in the afternoon and you sort of catch each other's eye and sort of think, oh, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing to each other? <laughs> the art of teaching too. Boredom hangs like a low cloud in the classroom. Each page we read is a step up a mountain in gluey boots. Even the clock face is pained, and yes, I'm sure now, ticking slower. If gloom has a sound, it's the voice of Leroy reading Frankenstein aloud. And if we break to talk, I know my questions are feeble sparks that won't ignite my students' barely beating hearts. There is no bolter here, no turn, just more of the same. The air sinking ever lower, the air damper, yet more rain. And the task is unchanging, like spending years chasing a monster you yourself created. Leroy asks if he can stop reading. I say, for now, he can. Well, the sixth form where I taught was like truly an international place. Um, you know, we had students that were sort of second, third generation, maybe from the Caribbean or African diasporas or uh, Southeast Asia and kids from Pakistan, Bangladesh, but also like relatively newly arrived students from Eastern Europe as well. And uh, we had lots of conversations in the classroom about what it meant to be British, what it meant to be English. Um, the students in the minority at the sixth form were actually uh, white English kids and particularly white working class students. And so this next poem is about one of them, the only English kid. When the debate got going on Englishness, I pity the only English kid, poor Johnny in his spotless Reeboks and blue Fred Perry. He had a voice from history the no miss, yes miss, no miss, all treatly cockney, rag and bone. And while the others claimed Poland and shook off England like the wrong team shirt, John brewed his tea exclusively on Holloway Road. So when Asif mourned the George Cross banner, swinging freely like a warning from his neighbor's roof, the subway tunnel sprayed with Muslim scum, poor John would sit there quietly looking guilty for all the awful things he hadn't done. Uh, and lastly, in this little section, I'll read a poem that's about, well, really it's about the advent of the, uh, of the computer in the classroom. When I first started teaching, we didn't even have a computer each. We had one that was in the staff room that we shared and the email wasn't something we were dependent on. And we certainly didn't have anything like a, a, class, uh, a computer in the classroom, an electronic whiteboard. And when we did, all of a sudden, it, it, there was all kinds of like learning opportunities at your fingertips, um, sometimes almost like uncomfortably so. Um, I can say a little more about that if um, uh, after, after um, I've read or in discussion, but um, I'll read you now this poem. Technology. Suddenly computers, screens and electronic pen. So off the cuff, I'd ping a poem up to mercy, pity, peace and love, or a drawing of the pardoner, an image of an ivory tusk, or a map, one that showed the heyday of the British Empire. The pale blue sea around the places half those kids had sort of come from once, shaded rich and bloody red. Thank you, Hannah. That was brilliant. I, do you want to kind of finish that thought that you started around technology and the kind of the how you said uncomfortably so <laughs> at your fingertips? 
Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's a bit like a kind of, um, <laughs> it's a sort of shoot the messenger scenario where, like when I'd gone to, like we were taught so little about the British Empire when I was at school, which was so, such a terrible, sorrowful thing because I really had very little idea how my own father had ended up in Britain uh, or anything about the way that he was because he'd grown up under uh, colonial rule in, in Jamaica, which made him terribly conflicted. You know, on the one hand, sort of hating Britain, on the other hand, completely admiring and revering it. When I'd gone to university, we did this module on theory and we moved very quickly from like structuralism to deconstruction to post-colonialism. And I literally didn't understand what post-colonialism was because I just didn't, I could have done with a map and someone to explain to me what the British Empire was and then how independence had happened and, and all the things that had happened during the time of empire. Like I needed that education and I didn't have it. And then all of a sudden as a teacher in front of these kids who had similar and also vastly different uh, backgrounds to mine. Um, the fact that I could just get a map like this up almost felt really uncomfortable. Like, look, look, I can show you, look, this is what, this is what the British did. Like, almost like, this is why you're here. Mm -hmm. And that felt very, um, yeah, I felt very, it, it was both like teaching that I wanted to do and learning I wanted that, it was knowledge I wanted them to have. But I also felt, almost a shame to be to be imparting it if that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely yeah I thought things fall apart at a level and in South Croydon had a very similar experience it's like why why am I explaining this when this is kind of you know not um yeah well it is my cultural background um it's everyone's cultural background I think it's it's something that's been kind of really um the debate has heated up recently with the the kind of the OCR announcement they were diversifying their GCSE poetry texts uh, and then the then education minister uh, Tahawi um sort of de decrying it as cultural vandalism what was your sort of take on that whole situation my take is on it, on it is that Philip Larkin and, and Wilfred Owen can be rested for a few years and they're not going to fall out of the canon <laughs> you know they're not going to they're not going to disappear um, you know, d diverse, I think one, one thing that I think polit politicians, maybe legislators don't understand is that for kids to really get poetry, they need to be able to read poetry that, that does come from the tradition and perhaps has got, you know, um, historical content or formal qualities that they can learn about and feel empowered about learning about but also to have poems that maybe in some way reflect their lives or the lives of people that they know um and that's not just it's not you know that's for all all young people in in multicultural britain today to see multicultural but also you know a, a society that's moved on so much in terms of gender uh, in recent years to have those voices on on a poetry syllabus it, it legitimizes them it gives them an important place and they they only exist there against poets that have probably been there um for years and years and years and on, are under no threat so I don't think yeah it's not cultural vandalism um it's a stupid thing to say <laughs> <laughs> we've had a comment in the chat which is um yeah took me right back to, to teaching in the 90s so um yeah really nice to see that Sarah and yeah if anyone else is kind of feeling similar they've had similar experiences please do share um, Hannah, we've had a question in the chat, which is um, any advice for teachers who are a bit reluctant or worried about uh, about using or teaching poetry in the class? So you, you, based on the fact that you talked about the fact that you started writing a bit later on, um, did was it kind of where did your confidence come from and, and was it was it reciprocal with your teaching and your writing? Um, so what's the question? Advice on teaching poetry because you yes, don't sorry. feel confident in doing so. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't, I suppose that sort of speaks to like the whole people feeling not confident about poetry in general, this idea that po poetry is, um, you know, a bit of an anathema and something to be decoded. And, um, you know, I wish, I kind of wish that perception could shift in poetry because um, it, it's, there are poems out there that are difficult. I mean, poetry, like all literature is, is you know, genres of literature is a really broad church. So you've got poems that are difficult and maybe do need decoding and are de deliberately or un, you know not deliberately um complicated and then you've got poems that just give themselves up in one reading 
and um, or poems that just with a little bit of work you can you can find meaning in. So I think it's about the poems that are taught as well. So like not not overwhelming or baffling students with the poems that you bring into the classroom. And I know to some degree there isn't much choice. You know, if you, I don't know if there's if they're still teaching an anthology uh, for the different exam boards like they were when I um, was teaching. But at that time when I was teaching, it was a pro, it was a poems from other cultures and um, there were some amazing poems in there you know that the students could really um, get to grips with and I mean I know there's a kind of slight critique of that anthology as being slightly tokenistic but we had great conversations about those poems but my other tip is about feeling you know the students often in my classes used to react with like, oh no we're not going to understand this it's a poem and we'd read it once and they would all look sort of confused by it. Um, now, what I would do, and I've do, I do at university, I get them to read it to them to each other. I get them to uh, whisper it. I get them to shout it out loud um, three or four times to kind of like almost take the poem into themselves, into their bodies, to embody the poem. And something about that sort of slightly demystifies poetry. Mm. It's always something that teachers could do if they feel the same. Um, as well. I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question, but uh, yeah, I totally think you are. That's that's really how poems and 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 then like shout them out the window. Yeah, not being scared of them. Um, yeah, I really like that. And I'd love to go back to so the first couple of poems you you read were obviously about your your early experiences in teaching, and I have to say the art of teaching too is. I mean, just that line, the voice of Leroy reading, uh, yeah, if Bloom has a sound, it's the voice of Leroy reading Frankenstein aloud. I, I'm sure there no one who has ever set foot in the classroom who cannot resonate with that in some way who hasn't had that experience. Um, what, what, why was it kind of your experiences in the classroom that, that you wanted to bring to life in this way? Well, partly, I mean, probably your reaction tell, gives you some of the answer. They were funny. I mean, it was like, looking back now, I just realised that whole scenario um of making kids like read really really long complicated novels <laughs> um it's almost sort of farcical thinking about it um I suppose what in seriousness what it was I, when I left teaching in 2012 I went off to do my PhD I was back teaching by two years later but I miss those kids so much. And I, I realized how much I'd learned from those 10 years of, of teaching. I realized that I'd learned, not only had I learned an awful amount about literature, I'd learned an awful amount about what it is to be young in Britain, um, you know, at that time. So yeah, like 2002, 2012, and a lot about my own identity as well, which, I'd, which was always kind of pretty unsettled as a kind of white looking, multi-heritage but you know via Jamaica but Afro-Chinese on one side and and white English working class on the other so yeah I, I wanted to ex I wanted to testify to those experiences I guess and yeah that's how the book began okay. there is sort of out to write so many of them <laughs> <laughs> there are just so many of those moments, aren't there? I mean, a theme that sort of recurs throughout the book is is that slight um, friction between sort of the the ideology that you've got going into the classroom and, and your your love for literature, your love for the subject, and this experience with the when you sit at this, you know, the pained clock face, and um, and it comes up a couple of times. You've got your um, when you talk about the punch pocket and how you know as if that can kind of capture and trap what a poem is in this in this plastic pocket and I, is is that kind of something you were particularly keen to draw out in the work yeah I, I, I had, I've never thought about it in the terms in which you just articulated it that I had this kind of yeah I mean I had a great love for reading and literature which I could not always like uh, communicate or convey um, or elicit a similar response in the students um, and it was you know, yeah, at times frustrating, definitely, um, at times really deeply sad, because there was something that we, I mean, I don't know what other teachers would think about this, but there was a sort of um, a discussion that went on, seemed to go on every year at, at, when I was a teacher about if kids hadn't started reading, if students hadn't started reading when they were young, that would be the defining thing in their lives. And, you know, and that was the difference between uh, young people that loved books and would pick up a book on their own, 
and young people who hadn't, for whatever reason, none of it their fault, had not done that and therefore found books difficult, challenging, you know. That said, though, even the most enthusiastic reader could have, like, thrown themselves off a cliff reading some of the things I'm <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hearing my time as a teacher. But, you know, so the, there was a, there's a sorrow there as well. But on the other side of that, there was also, like, and I don't know if I wrote about this enough in, in the collection, those moments when it all just went gloriously well mm. and students loved what we were um, reading. You know, one example of that was Othello. I mean, always Othello would, would cut through anything uh, and get such interesting debates going. And also teaching, like, when I used to teach English literature and language, some of those like more complex, like linguistic terms, I couldn't even get my head around myself. I had to literally look them up before I'd go into the classroom and then teach them and then they'd go out of my head again. Um, some of the students really got that stuff. They really loved that stuff and they really started applying it, you know, not just in the books we were reading, but in other texts as well. But there's a lot of kind of empowerment going on there as well. So, you know, it wasn't all, it wasn't all one thing or another. It was an incredibly mixed bag. Uh, year after year. Amazing. Well, on that note, I think we should move on and hear a bit more of your experience in the classroom with Janine. Um, and uh, as as Hannah reads the next question, we've got some more questions starting to come into the, um, the Q&A function now. So uh, keep those coming in as Hannah reads the next few poems. Okay. Am I reading Janine one and two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Janine was a Monday morning queasy feeling. I was never ready for her choice's sting. The late strutting, teeth kissing, rolling eyes, my protest swacked away like swatted flies, or else the bleat of questions, 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 a pinging hand, a jack in the box, a gun she kept on firing, asking over and over why we couldn't study Harry Potter. Or worse, the searing telescopic stare I winced in as she coiled a lock of hair around the middle finger that shone at me. And this went on for months until somebody said the thing and finally bought ease. My dad was half Jamaican, half Chinese. And I'll read Janine one. My dad was half Jamaican, half Chinese. Her question at my office door. Her face gone softer, searching mine for vestiges of blackness, as if she'd find a sign, a trace, the more she sought. And when I told her yes, was some fire put out? It's hard to know what heat, or presume a heat at all, or guess the stakes when teachers rarely look like those they teach. Oh, sorry, everyone. Um, like those they teach. The whiteness of my skin has been confusion, chaos, agency. Janine was nicer after, or what's up miss and hey, like neither me nor her remembered Monday's knackering spun out war. She dropped her gun. I'd somehow been excused. I'd been forgiven. And the next poem I'll read, I mentioned already this, like the idea that I didn't have an English degree. I'd really read at university. I'd read totally outside of um, the canon. Um, I'd read lots of like American literature and black women's writing. And then I was often having to teach literary movements at A-level, you know, um, and having to learn them. And so, and it's also about kind of like cultural capital. Like if you don't come from the kind of family that would have uh, certain kinds of knowledge, like how are you meant to pick up? Uh, the knowledge, for example, of how Samuel Pepys's name is meant to be pronounced when it's not spelt like that. Uh, I'm sure the learned audience all knew this, but I did not. Peppies. The posh girls came and took a corner table, all lip gloss and ribbony hair, each with a fan of starry GCSEs, a summer of youth hostels in Europe behind them, and the future wide open to them like a rainbow parasol or so I thought. It was restoration comedies and I was reading the class and essay and though I'd seen his name, I'd never heard it. Peppies, I said it, peppies, peppies, over and over until one girl spoke up. Do you mean peeps, she said, her voice pulled taut as a noose, as if I was the girl and she the teacher. And what could I have said? I read on, peppies, 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 
cool, cool as the trickster, ridiculous as the fool. Uh, yeah, it's so nice. There are so many of these comic moments throughout the throughout the book, but I mean, kind of interspersed with with kind of really poignant and profound moments as well. But um, yeah, thank you. Um, I mentioned we've had a couple more questions going, so I'm going to go to some questions from the from the audience. If that's okay. Um, so there's one here uh, which talks about um, someone who is who is a teacher poet who's in a very similar situation to what you were, uh, and says it can be problematic using even anonymized um, student stories in our own work, especially given the power dynamic. Just wondering what your thoughts were about that. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, I think there are you know yes. I suppose what I did, I don't think I thought about it that much as I was writing. And then as the book began to um, kind of cement itself, uh, I began to think about how, because there is a power dynamic, inevitably, like these are young people. They, I mean, look, most of the kids I taught are now in their 20s and 30s now, but they were young people over whom, yes, I had power uh, as a teacher. So I suppose one of the things I try to do is to like destabilize my own power all the time in the book, which is why I'm often there as being feckless or useless or not knowing uh, all, all those sorts of things. And then there's a, there's a lot of um, anonymity going on in the poems. Like none of the students are real in, in the book, but there's also other, massive um, fabrications going on partly because of the form so like the sonnet form like if you have to write metrically and rhyme you just start lying and so there's so much of these um of these scenarios are fabricated and I don't know if that sort of is that a get out of jail free card um probably not but I suppose what I'm trying to say is as far as the the ethics are like I did everything I think I ca I could, um, and of course, what I wasn't anticipating is the co the controversy around Kate Clanchy's book, which I had no idea was happening was going to happen, and and all of that stuff. And I mean, when that happened, I did think, oh my god, like ah. And then I thought, no, I I don't think I've written. I don't think I've written a, about these students mm. in, in ways that are problem problematic. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of it's very observational, isn't it? And um and very endearing as well, lots of it. I think there's it's clear that it's kind of written with love, which is uh, really nice, really nice to see. Um actually mentioning of, of uh, sonnets kind of was one question I had. You at some point you talk about poetry is um what's the phrase you talk about um it's something about mud, uh <laughs> trying to oh, teach yes. something no, and it feeling like a mud of words that's exactly that a mud of words so having taught sonnets to resitters what made you think that you kind of you know had had to kind of use this form and and why was it the sonnet that you chose for the book um I don't think I did choose it for the book I think I what really happened is I just started sketching out a few poems about teaching I had no idea it would be a collection at this point and because I love form and I'd written in form before in my previous collections um I was writing I was writing in sonnets um and part of that is probably to do with the fact that I had taught form so I understood form its rules and requirements. I, I'd known about form for a long time through teaching, but beyond that, before that, I'd also grown up uh, playing a lot of music. So I really understood meter. I didn't know I, I understood it, but after like 15 years of piano lessons, I did understand, I do understand rhythm. And I think that, you know, gave me a, a you know, bit of an advantage with the form. And then, and then what happened, to cut a long story short, is that I, I started to see there was more of a sequence um, and then I thought I might try and write what they call a, a crown, a seven, uh, seven sonnets interlinked, uh, like beginning and first lines, or even a heroic crown, which is 15. Actually, I wrote 15, inter no, 35 interlinked sonnets before I realised yeah. that didn't really work. Um, but the sonnet, you know, form will always make you say something more interesting. For me, it will make me say something way more interesting than I would say, I would say in free verse. 
So that's the short answer. Sorry, that was a really yeah. rambling. No, that's really interesting. Thank you. And I also started to see how in poems that are about classroom encounters, the sonnet looked a little bit like mimetically. It sort of looks a bit like a classroom or a blackboard mm. kind of book. You know. Yeah, it's kind of a metaphor in its own right, isn't it? It's kind of, you know, uh, creative and a bit messy within the constraints. <laughs> That's, that really is a metaphor for the classroom, which is really nice. Um, we've had a lov uh, lovely question in from the audience, which is, um, what role do you think that creative writing or writing poems could play in teaching poetry to young people? I think it could play a massive role, like huge, because, you know, poetry, if when young people get poetry and they get into it and they write it, um, it can be really like it can be in so uh, it can be so legitimizing of their own experiences. It can give them a voice. It can give them an outlet. Um, it's a way of them working through things. It can be therapeutic. I mean, I deeply you don't want to say that about poetry. It's like thera therapeutic is a dirty word, but it is deeply therapeutic and healing. Like it's got there are so many facets to poetry and I've seen it I've seen it when young people get into writing how uh how that really can pick them up and lift them up and then once you if you if you get young people into writing poems they're going to be way more interested in reading them in reading them by other people because that's what happened to me I mean I I wouldn't have tried to, I wouldn't have bothered trying to read half the poetry I've, I've read over my life if I hadn't had an interest in writing it you mm. know no, absolutely. And I think it's a different way of reading as well, isn't it? Because we're so we're so comfortable with that that reciprocity of going, you know, OK, yes. Uh, once you can once you've very well read, you're you're kind of well prepared to, to be a writer. I don't think we talk as much about how it works the other way around as well. And actually, as a writer, you read things differently and you kind of you're looking for the choices more that authorial intention, which you need at those higher levels at GCSE and A level. They come so much more naturally. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, really it's, it's kind of fascinating you know you're reading with a different kind of energy and the poem isn't um, a specimen to be put under a microscope and observed it's a living you know uh, organic thing that yeah and you, you're looking as you say you're looking for, for the choices mm. um, you're looking for what you can learn from it as well yeah yeah absolutely um somehow miraculously we are doing brilliantly for time which is amazing so um can we have both john poems please uh and yeah we'll yeah. kind of hand back over and, and hopefully come back for some more yeah audience please do keep popping your questions in the chat and we'll come back for some more in a few poems time okay i'm just trying to get rid of my little questions but yeah so the book is dedicated sorry it's a rather irreverent picture of my a-level english teacher john Toulon, to whom the book is uh, dedicated and um I went to a very traditional secondary school. Um, I wasn't allowed into the sixth form because I was so badly behaved. And I was sent off to Barking College in East London to do my A-levels. And there I met John Tudor and another teacher called John McDermott, who were just such radicals um, and also had like incredibly high expectations of us, which was so weird because I'd gone to a very selective secondary school where I felt that expectations of me were not were not high at all and then I'd got to this college and we were right raggle taggle of kids at, at that um at that FE college and yet their expectations of us were so were so high so I'll read two poems that are about John Toulon Pink Hummingbird the postcard he sent you in that long wet summer had on one side a pale pink hummingbird and overleaf his notes on your essay on Faulkner in his usual turquoise ink. The words you imagined written in sunlight on the bed of his book stuffed flat, each weighed with care like a love letter. There was you that wanted him. All summer you waited for September to be back in the tattered classroom, the tables pushed together and him at the top like a doting father or a bridegroom or like God, with God wore Doc Martin's shoes and a silver sleeper in one ear. Not the God you didn't believe in, but one who believed in you. The first book that John Toulon um, gave us as A-level English students was Enter Zaki Shange's Coloured Girls. Um, if anyone knows that book, uh, it's a, a book of poetry set to dance. It's a choreo poem, and it was about black women's uh, experiences in America. And uh, it's a kind of rad radical book. And it spoke to me in a way that nothing I had studied 
um, hitherto had, had done. I think because I was interested, I was getting interested in my own, in my dad's life story. And even though it was tangential, you know, Black American women, the story of the British Empire and Jamaica, there were clear connections. It was the story of the marginalized. And uh, yeah, and also just the fact that all these kids sort of sat in a classroom at Barking College reading this book and he used to try and make us read it in our in American accents as well. It's kind of excruciating, but uh, good at the same time. Let me just move on. So the full title of that book is For Coloured Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough. Our vows were flat as the dead fish that floated in Dagenham docks, but still John made us recite these lines meant for black women who said, I have poems, big thighs, little tits, which made us blush as our estuary tongues went tripping over cuz and enough and the slashes the poets scattered over her page. And the whole bloody thing was set to dance and on another planet compared to Essex and my pals whose mums served up school dinners, whose dads worked nights at Fords. We could just make out the half rubbed words of last year's kids like patriarchy, nationhood. And soon I borrowed in my own new terms, hegemony, resistance, sisterhood. And I'll finish my little reading with, I think uh, the last, yeah, the last poem here, it's not the last poem in the book, is about taking um, students to the theatre. And it's, it's a sort of parallel in my life because as a sixth form student at Barking College, we used to get the cheap ticket to the Barbican or the National and go and see um, Shakespeare plays, the discounted tickets. And then fast forward, you know, um, 10, 15 years, I was the teacher taking students to the theatre. Some students like, like myself who had never really been to the theatre and knew nothing about the kind of mores and manners of the theatre and others who, who did, but uh, it always used to make me laugh. Um, once we took them to see a Twelfth Night, um, at one London theatre, another it was a matinee show. And I'd said to them, you know, um, the food is expensive, you know, ice cream and stuff in the interval is expensive, so bring, bring something from home. And when I looked down the row, they'd all poured out like two, you know, two litre bottles of um, Fanta, big bags of um, Doritos, <laughs> Pringles and chicken. And, and my friend, my colleague at the time said about taking, I think 60 kids to see Othello. This is more like bloody dog walking than teaching. The sixth form theatre trip. You've got more dogs than you can count. Big dogs and small. One badass dog in headphones mooching up the aisle a dog who smuggled in a hot dog. Two loving dogs back row already smooching. Some dogs are up on haunches barking, a dog or two already dozing, heads in paws, dogs sighing and dreaming. The other theatre dogs look down their snouts, a pair of tutting chow chows, some slony poodles in the box. But when the curtains lift and your dogs are hypnotised, their ears like little hoisted sails, the wag of tails, their shining dog hearts fling wide open. They know these words, these lines, memorized like buried bones. And don't you love your dogs? Thank you, Hannah. I don't know if you're keeping a uh, half an eye on the chat, but there's a lot of love for those, uh, those last few poems. So we had, um, yeah, the pink hummingbird, uh, lots of warmth in that one that we love. We love the dog hearts flinging wide open. Um, so yeah, lots of uh, lots of appreciation <laughs> for those poems in the chat. Um, I think I'd love to kind of start with um, with the John poems and, and particularly the sort of the for coloured girls one. Um, I, I heard you talking in another interview, Hannah, and saying that the, the act of writing can itself be an act of resistance because it gives a voice to those who may have been denied one. I just think that's such a fascinating statement. Are you able to kind of share a bit more of your thinking around that? Um, yeah, just the fact that, you know, writing, um, uh, not just writing, but having the time, the space, the encouragement to write, um, having the opportunities for uh, being taught how to write, being mentored and all that kind of stuff. 
um, having the opportunity to be published um, and your work shared widely. These are just not things that lots of people have. They are things that have traditionally been associated with privilege, um, often with being white, often with being male, often with being, you know, from a certain class background, middle class or above. Um, and that has been the tradition for hundreds of years. You know, that's what, you know, you know this, I mean, I'm not telling you anything new. So to, to write, to be heard in that context, if you don't come from that background, it is a way of uh, resisting your place, isn't it? It's the way of testifying to your, to your experience. Um, and, and being her, but it doesn't mean that doors immediately you can write, but it doesn't mean the doors are going to be open to yes. you. And that's still the case uh, now, although I think things are slowly changing yeah. in, in the UK. So to write is, yeah, to write if you do not come from a place that has allowed you to write, to be a writer, it is to resist. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's a really beautiful point. And I actually, um, I couldn't have planned it better, if I'm honest, because our most recent research into writing, uh, which we published at the end of June on National Writing Day, talks about um, so the state of kids writing uh, and kind of how many children are, are choosing to write and are enjoying writing is, is pretty dire. But for those that are, they're choosing to write because it's creative. It kind of links to their well-being, gives them a, an outlet, exactly like you were talking about earlier. And it's that idea of social connection and social change. So you've kind of, um, you know, coloured in for us <laughs> what, what our numbers are. You know, I, I know that this is a, a webinar full of teachers, so I don't need to hammer home the point that we are born creative. Children are so creative and then we are educated out of creativity. That's what happens to us at, at school, particularly at the time we've left primary school into secondary school. Essays become the, meet out, the way in which we communicate and creative subjects are demoted in terms of their importance. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy because um, it's so good for us. It, it, and it, it's also, it's part of human nature. Um, so whenever my creative writing undergrads turn up in first years, I always want to like hug them and congratulate them for finding, but not ever losing their creativity or in some cases finding their way back to it. Mm. Mm, that links on really well. Um, so Juliet's put a question in the chat in the um, Q and A function. So uh, this might relate to your sixth form students or to your undergrads, I think. Um, but she says, "Do you have any poems which you found really worked as a stimulus for students' own writing?" Oh, do you know I can't remember who wrote that poem, but Kim Moore does a, has a model of it in her book called *The Art of Falling*, and it's the poem that uses the anaphoric phrase, I come from, and it's like, it begins, I come from people who, I can't remember who wrote the original, it's terrible, it slipped my mind. But if you look it up, Kim Moore's poem, I come from, is a brilliant model for getting young people to write. Um, there's a few that I really love. Jackie Wills's eavesdropping is another really great one. It's about phoning home and listening into your family or carers and what they're doing. Um, these are sort of poems that any like any young person can write uh, in some in some ways. So those two, and I could probably think of a few others. Um, I think the staying alive, being alive, being human anthologies by Blood Dax as well are really great places to look for for poems to inspire young people. Yeah, they are fab anthologies. Um, okay, we've got about ten minutes left, so still would really welcome more more questions in the in the chat and questions. Um, Hannah, you just touched on, you mentioned uh, mentoring relationships and in the course of the prep for this session, you've kind of mentioned uh, your own mentor and some of the people that you have mentored as well. Can you kind of talk a bit more about, you know, that how does that mentor-mentee relationship work? How important has that been for, for you and your, your work? Um, yeah, huge, hugely important. So uh, when I, when I, my journey into writing, when I first started, as I told you, I sort of wrote in secret for a couple of years and then I started doing courses and I started at the beginning, I did introduction to poetry. Then I did, you know, like whatever the next thing was, I did loads and loads of courses for about three years, four years, all I did was courses at the poetry school. And then I became, you know, I was getting somewhere, I was getting the odd thing published and I got into a, a kind of selective course called the Advanced Poetry Workshop, it still runs at the Poetry School now. And the tutor was Mimi Calvati. And that was like 12, 15 years ago. And then Mimi has kind of mentored me ever since. 
then, which on the one hand is editorial, right? I mean, she's got a brilliant critical eye and I sort of write with her perched on my shoulder. I mean, she could be quite harsh. She says things, oh, it's very nice, darling, but is it a poem? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So like, that's quite, I mean, it's quite good to have something like that on your shoulder. But she also kind of inducted me into the literary world. Cause I just, it's a whole world that has all its own codes and conventions of publishers, of events, of courses, of, of, of writers about which I knew nothing absolutely nothing and through like lots of conversations with her I you know I guess I, I became introduced and then familiar with that world and so in my own mentoring um I've mentored you know lots of writers and, and sometimes it is just editorial but with someone like Ray Anchibus who I mentored for as part of the complete works program and then afterwards a lot of that was actually about um permission you know because we both had Jamaican fathers, problematic relationships uh, with our Jamaican fathers. And, you know, he was beginning to write about his and I had already written about mine. And so a lot of it was about talking through the issues. What could we talk, what could we say? Like, what could he say? What was okay to say? What, what did he have permission to say? And, and then, you know, encouragement and all that kind of stuff um, as well. And of course you become, what you really become is good friends. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 If you mentor someone for long enough, or you're mentored by someone for long enough. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And yeah, I'm kind of in awe of <laughs> that kind of that that list is pretty impressive. Um we've got loads of questions flooding in now. Um so we've got some kind of top tips type questions. Um so we started talking a bit about creativity. So there's a question here. Um we'd love to hear Hannah's thoughts on how young teachers can resist the pressure of management and increasing focus on teaching exams and cutting creativity out of the curriculum. <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question. <laughs> I think you know I'm really aware of what has happened. It was beginning to happen in teaching when I left. We were getting, it was the kind of advent of like target setting and all the kind of mad data driven work, like increasing workload. You know, night is nightmarish. And in fact, I happen to know that the whole of my department where I worked at the sick form resigned this week. And um, not resigned, they left this week, they resigned, they mass resignation in protest against bad management. And I just, and the increasing pressures upon teachers. So I don't know, what, what do, I, I mean, I suppose the answer is to try to try and bring it in where, where you know, when, when you can, can you bring something quick into yeah. every other lesson? You know, that's that small measures, I suppose, but, I, I know that when I was a teacher, like um, the kids were assessment obsessed because yeah. they've been, that's what they, their experience of school have been. And um, it, it made you work to that as well. It made you work to the assessment. So I'm sorry not to give a more positive yeah. answer. <laughs> um, have, you, have you got any, like where do your creative writing students, have they tended to do that in their own time at home? Are they sort of, do you yeah, know? Say five years ago, I would have got some students, undergrads that had come through the creative writing A level, but of course the current regime dispensed with that, not that long, you know, a few years back. So no, most of them have come through um, A levels and have been writing themselves. Often you get, um, you know, one of the big things I've noticed is that we've got a lot of kids, that are, lot of young people that um, are really into fantasy. Mm. They're, really, they're into fantasy, either through video games through TV or through uh, reading and often a combination of three. And that really, that you often get young people that want to come and write fantasy. And when you get, actually get the hold of them, you then get them writing all kinds of other things. And sometimes they go off writing fantasy altogether and other, others do stick at it. But that is definitely one kind of pathway I've noticed. It's, it's those young people and the fantasy thing. Although, I mean, frankly, if I have to read about another portal that someone <laughs> into a mother <laughs> universe i'm gonna shoot myself <laughs> you won't tell your students don't worry <laughs> but i tell them that i might think of something else <laughs> oh dear me um 
we've just had an absolutely brilliant link I'll share with you after Hannah and um, one of our brilliant Bradford schools that we work with a lot did uh, some work using the I come from stimulus and there's a, a BBC version of their poem that was produced so if you haven't seen that oh, amazing oh good and you probably know the original which I shouldn't have um, forgotten I always use Kim Moore's one in teaching because it's so brilliant yeah, yeah yeah no that's really cool um okay so uh We've got quite a couple more questions, which are uh, sort of, yeah, top tips type things. So um, there's a museum on the call. I believe it might be the National Justice Museum in Nottingham. And um, they would love to have poetry writing sensory tours in their dungeons and courtrooms. Um, what would you suggest to make the sessions really powerful? Gosh, that's putting you on the spot, isn't it? <laughs> that's quite a big oh, creative <laughs> question. Hang on, I didn't really, you're going to have sensory rooms in the museum. So, poetry writing tours in the dungeons and the courtrooms. How could you make those powerful? Powerful. I have I have no no idea, <laughs> but give me give me a few days and I'll think. <laughs> we'll come back. I mean, so is, my immediate thought is that there are so many brilliant poems that are about incarceration and and, and imprisonment. You mm. know, to have to have you know, and there's nothing like having a poem spoken. So mm. I was thinking, you know, recordings or live readings even. Yeah, that would be really cool. My accountant always says to me, he's always says to me things like, so Hannah, have you done any, uh, he's quite old, he says, have you done any readings, you know, perhaps dressed as a, in a in World War One costume? So he's sort of fixated with, the, as though that's what poets do, they wear costumes and they perform poems <laughs> about the war. And I always say no, but for some reason, that's what leads into my head. You could have some people dressed, up, you know, dressed appropriately, reading, yeah. poetry performance, I guess, but l l yeah. leave that with me, I'm not sure. But I'm glad to know that your museum exists. Yeah, it's a gorgeous museum. And yeah, we, we have a, an amazing poetry resource on the National Literature Trust website, uh, which, <laughs> which relates to the National Justice Museum. Again, I'll send you the link later, Heather. Um, yeah, amazing. OK, do we have any more questions? We, we've got maybe three minutes to go. We should probably wrap up there, I think, actually, if that's OK. Hannah, it's been an absolute joy. If joy had a sound, it would be this webinar. I've loved chatting to you. Um, thank you so, so much. Uh, we're going to pop a, a link in the chat now to, um, to the kids published by Blood Axe Books. Uh, audience members, if you haven't already read it, if you haven't bought a copy already, please, please do. Um, yeah, Hannah, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. You're very welcome. It was my my pleasure. And as my son's foot was just rolled into <laughs> uh, that is actually he did cute. very well for 57 minutes. He did brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you, Faye, for your um, you know, really thoughtful questions. Thanks, Hannah. Take care. Bye.